All right, guys, so we are going to start notes on the French Revolution. So your notes are long on the French Revolution. That's because um, we are going to break it down into a couple of sections. So we're going to break the revolution itself down into four stages, and I'm also going to separate causes from that. So there's essentially five sections to these notes. So if you scroll through them, you'll see the start with the causes of the French Revolution, stage one, stage two, stage three, which is very brief, and then stage four. Um, so I know it looks like a lot. We're going to break it down day by day, so we're not going to do it all in one day. Um, these are notes that are going to be broken up over the next few days. Um, so that's how we're going to kind of approach this particular event. So go ahead and pull up the um, PowerPoint, which is attached here for you um, in the document. All right. So today we're going to start with the causes of the French Revolution. So you guys are going to do an activity after this where you guys are going to go over some of the causes. Um, but let's start with cause number one. So in France, um, this is obviously after Enlightenment ideas have started to spread, after Louis XIV has died um, and his uh, you know, line of succession has continued. Um, so we're talking about the same monarchy that we were looking at or the same bloodline that we were looking at when we talked about um, Louis XIV, the Sun King, when we looked at absolute monarchs. And so France still has the same kind of government, um, same kind of social structure. And so that's kind of what we're going to look at. What are the underlying problems with how France was structured after or before the revolution and essentially after Louis XIV? And we talked about Louis XIV using his power as an absolute monarch to really successfully control all aspects of France. So the first issue that France has is they have this issue of major social inequalities. So this is after the Enlightenment. Um, we've had a lot of Enlightenment thinkers talk about, you know, men having equal rights, um, men having, you know, rights to life, liberty, and property like Locke. And so um, a lot of these ideas are spreading throughout Europe. So when we look at France, France has this really old class structure known as the old regime um, or the estates system right here. So you need to be familiar with the estate system. So this is the old class structure in France, and it basically divides France into three social classes. Um, and it's sometimes referred to as the old regime. So if you hear the old regime, um, you, we're also referring to like this old class estates system. So the first estate, which is the highest social class, is the clergy. These are your church officials. So remember, the Catholic Church is still prominent in some areas of Europe. So they hold one percent of the land, or they're one percent of the people, and they own ten percent of the land in France. Okay, so this is your highest social class, and then you have your nobility. So your rich landowners, they own two percent. Uh, or sorry, they are two percent of the people, and they own twenty-five percent of the land. Okay, so thirty-five percent of the land is split between 3% of the population. This is where the majority of your wealth is concentrated in France. So these are your two wealthiest social classes. Then you have the third estate. It's 97% of the population, and it basically includes everyone who's not within the clergy or the nobility. Um, so this is like your middle class, your peasants, your city workers, farmers, etc. Anybody, basically everyone else. Okay, so your commoners. And they share 65% of the land. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind. So we can already see that there's a little bit of an unequal distribution of land, right? And that the majority of the wealth in France is also concentrated within these really small first two social classes. Now, if you're wondering about where the king stands, the king is, of course, above or viewed as above the social class system. He's not within the social class system. Remember, France still has an absolute monarchy, so he is, you know, ruling by divine right theory. So let's talk about this um, political cartoon. Okay, so can we guess who is who in this picture? So this is actually a French political cartoon um, from the time period, okay? And it is depicting 
the estate system and the issue that we're seeing in France with the estate system. So this guy up here, right, if you look at how he's dressed, he's richly dressed, um, really nice clothing um, for the time period. I know we all think that he's probably dressed a little funny, um, traditional dress for the time, um, but that is going to be the nobility. Okay, so you can tell by the way that they're dressed. And then this guy right here, right? Also nicely dressed, but wearing a cross. That's gonna be your clergy. And then we have the poor man who is clearly older. He is also holding um, a tool that would be used for farming. Okay, um, and then you can see that his clothing is not as nice, right? He's um, wearing um, culottes um, or pants. Um, so they're not traditional like these tights, okay? Um, these knee britches, um, so, uh, or he's not necessarily wearing like the traditional nice knee britches and nice clothing of the time. So this is your peasant, your commoner, um, carrying these two men on his back. So this is kind of giving us the idea that this was what's happening in France, right? The commoners, the people who were doing all of the work are supporting these two higher social classes, okay? They're supporting the clergy, they're supporting the nobility and their nice little lavish way of life. And clearly the peasantry is run down, okay? They're tired. Right. So the third estate, like we said, if you kind of look at these, um, these graphs here, um, it was 97 to 98% of the population, depends on what you look at or what you know historian you ask, but roughly, 97 to 98% of the population, a majority, has to share 65% of their land. So you can see here, this is where they are in the population. Okay, so the third estate is this gray area. They're 98% of the population. There is the first and second estate as well. Um, when it comes to land ownership, this 98% is sharing this chunk of 65%. And this little 3%, 2 to 3% is sharing this 35% um, of the land. But here's the kicker for the peasants as well. So we know that there's obviously some unfair land distribution, but also they are the only social class that has to pay taxes. So the wealthiest part of the population, the first and second estate, don't have to pay taxes. This is something that has been part of the old regime for a really long time. Um, and so if you think about it right, the majority of the wealth is concentrated within the first and second estate. They own 35% of the land. They could really pay a good portion of these taxes, but the third estate, the commoners, those are the people that you are taxing in France. So it uh, makes sense because obviously they're the masses, but the first and second estate should really be paying taxes is what I'm saying. All right, so those are some social inequality issues we have. We'll come back to them. Um, and then we have political issues in France. Um, so we said that enlightenment ideas are becoming really popular. A lot of people are talking about maybe absolute monarchs aren't necessarily the best form of government or an absolute monarchy isn't the best form of a government for a country. Um, and also France has kind of aided other countries in revolutions that were built upon enlightenment ideas like the American Revolution. France aided the colonists in the American Revolution against the British um, because of the continuously um, bad blood um, between France and Great Britain. Um, but because this revolution was built on Enlightenment ideas and France supported the revolution, a lot of these Enlightenment ideas are going to start to seep into France. Um, and that is because of the existing issues that France is experiencing. Um, so they're really far in debt um, after the building of Versailles. So we'll talk about that in just a second. And the monarchy doesn't really do anything to address the spending issue for a really long time. So since Louis the Fourteenth. We've seen two kings since him. We're at Louis the 16th now. It's this guy. He's king. Um, and he does not really handle matters of state very well. He um, isn't really trying to address or doesn't know how to address the issue um, with the financial crisis in France. Um, you know, taxing the first and second estate would be a good place to start. And we'll talk about why that hasn't necessarily been a reform that has been passed in France yet. Um, but the monarchy is going to continue to spend, and um, a lot of that blame is placed on Marie Antoinette. This is Louis XVI's wife. Marie Antoinette was Austrian, so this was a French and Austrian alliance. Um, that is the kind of the, the point of their marriage um, to kind of solidify that alliance between Austria and France, who had long time um, been enemies. 
Um, but Marie Antoinette was not particularly popular amongst the masses because she was rumored to have a spending problem. Um, and so uh, she spent lavishly on her clothing, her shoes, um, on parties and things like that, fashion, um, and didn't necessarily um, spend on French goods either. She liked luxury items from other areas. And so a lot of people kind of hearing about this really didn't like Marie Antoinette. She, it's important to remember, was not French. So she came to France at a very young age and got married um, and was expected to produce children, which it took them a very long time to produce children. So further rumors about why they didn't have heirs for a you know, long period of time also made them you know, increasingly unpopular. Um, but she really didn't understand the French people or French customs. And part of that is because the French monarchy is in Versailles. They are miles outside of Paris, so about 12 to 14 miles outside of Paris, the capital. And so they're really separated from the masses of people and they only live amongst the nobility. So for her, she doesn't really have a chance to understand the real people of France or French tradition. Um, her job is to basically, you know, see that they produce heirs, which, like I said, she also had not done. Um, so Marie Antoinette, unfortunately, just because of her you know, basically her duty um, at the time, um, you know, she was really unpopular because she didn't really know a lot about French customs and French culture. Um, and the king's power at this time was also unlimited. So like we talked about with Louis XIV, we still have an absolute monarchy. So Louis XVI, even though he's pretty much an incompetent ruler, doesn't he doesn't rule with an iron fist really in the same way that um, Louis XIV did. He's not as strategic. He doesn't understand economics like Louis XIV did, um, but he controls all aspects of um, French life. So your, your, your country is in the hands of two really incompetent rulers because one's not French and nor does she really have any or possess any power um, and the other really just isn't prepared to be king. Um, and so the Palace of Versailles, where they live, so this is an overhead drawing of what the palace had looked like. So you can see it's very large. All of these vast gardens in the back entryway, etc. Um, but we're not really sure. Historians aren't really sure how much this actually cost the French people, which again, the third estate would have paid for the Palace of Versailles because they are the only estate that was taxed. So when Louis XIV built Versailles, which it was added on to several times um, to create this large size, because remember, he's housing the nobility in this palace. Um, he created a lot of debt, which honestly, a lot of those um, documents were lost. And that's why historians don't really know how much it costs. So it can be anywhere from $2 billion to $300 billion um, estimated. And then the upkeep of Versailles, everything within this palace was, you know, there was no expense spared, obviously. So to keep up with a palace like this and to keep it in good shape and to also, also house the nobility consistently and constantly um, costs a lot of money. Okay, so further debt, not just the building of Versailles, but keeping Versailles in good condition, keeping the people that live there supported. Um, we said the monarchs are continuing to spend as well. And then France um, agriculturally is not doing very well. So the masses of the population, the peasants, have experienced bad harvest, famine. Um, also, the French monarchy has invested in wars that they haven't necessarily been able to afford, like the Seven Years' War, which was between... Um, England and France and a couple of other European countries over land in the Americas. And unfor unfortunately, the French were not successful, which is one of the reasons why they aid the colonists in the American Revolution. So all of this creates really, really bad debt <laughs> in France. Um, so th and they, they haven't um, created a way to kind of pull themselves out of this economic turmoil, but they continually um, tax the third estate. Okay, so this is where we're going to stop. These are your three causes. We have economic issues, political instability, and then social inequality. So you guys are going to do your worksheet on um, the causes of the French Revolution now.